Welcome to the meeting. Um, we are very excited to welcome uh, our new superintendent, uh, Dan Shelton. Uh, he'll be joining us in uh, probably in the next few minutes. Uh, as soon as he joins in, we'll, uh, we'll introduce him. But be before we uh, go to that point, uh, we do have a lot of exciting things to talk about with the referendum. You know, we're still savoring that success. So I'm going to hand it over to Mary. Uh, take it away, Mary. Okay. So um, thanks everyone for being here. We, uh, just as a matter of logistics, we kind of forced this meeting um, so that we could have one in June. Um, this is a Wednesday. We normally meet on a Thursday. Next month, we're going to shift back to a Thursday. But our regular meeting schedule is going to be for the third Thursday of the month um, because our new superintendent, Dr. Shelton, has expressed an interest in attending our meetings and he has a pre existing commitment on the fourth. So we've shifted to the third. I've checked with a number of different people who um, can't make it here tonight but said that that shouldn't be a problem going forward. So we intend to stick to a regular meeting schedule, third Thursday. Um, and so make a note of that, right? Um, we also need to continue moving forward with kind of formalizing our operating structure. Although we are uh, on paper a 501c3, we're still operating very much like the loose network that we began as, and we need to move uh, forward with that. So that's the thing we're gonna be talking about um, maybe not so much tonight, but um, between now and next month, right? So that. Um, our agenda is simple tonight. We're going to have Alva give us a little recap from the referendum. Um, if there's anything she needs to add. I mean, we all know the amazing, incredible results. And in every public forum I've been in, I have to, a lot of things went into making it so successful. But I, I firmly believe Alva was the linchpin that kind of just held it all together and did an amazing job with a marketing campaign and just kept pushing out wonderful materials that we then pushed out to our network. So um, just kudos to Alva um, for that. So she's going to share with us a few more insights and maybe some stories about what people did. We're just getting involved. And hopefully he can um, talk about uh, the team that he's putting together because some of those individuals were uh, confirmed at the board meeting last. A couple people who are um, there. Where do we go from here? How does, what are some of the things that this group actually feels maybe that the district needs? Um, what are the challenges? How can we support it? And um, if you were on our Facebook page today, you saw a little form that we put up there to try to gather a little data. And maybe Naveed can share that by the time we get to that point in the, uh, in the agenda. But that's the last item for us to talk about. So we'll try to keep it to about an hour because I know everybody's busy, got another Zoom meeting maybe to go to, who knows. Um, so let, let me just let Alva say some words about the referendum. Thank you so much, Mary. Thank you guys for inviting me. Uh, thank you so much for the kudos. You know, we couldn't do it without the support of everyone, you know, in this meeting in our community. But we, on behalf of the Christina School District, I would like to send our sincere appreciation to our community for supporting Christina's capital and our referendum. The past of this referendum means significant difference in the district's ability to maintain quality educational programs um, and better opportunities for our students, students obviously. Um, I'd like to extend uh, a special thanks to the tireless efforts of the people who helped pass the referendum. And um, thanks go out to our steering committee, which we are proud to have um, focus, um, participate on our steering committee as well. And to um, the many community organizations who shared our information with their networks and endorsed the referendum. And of course, our current district leadership team board, building leaders, teachers, staff, and our wonderful students who made these very compelling videos they were awesome that we could share with our community. And also, um, you know, I didn't have a chance to publicly, but 
I definitely want to send a special thanks to um, my team in the public information office, Latasha and Beth, who work really hard with our digital messaging and just, you know, many hours making sure, you know, that people have what they needed to be successful to help us in getting the word out. Also, I want to give a, sh a shout out to Dr. Shelton, who um, connected with local um, elected officials and leaders to drum up some excitement around the referendum and shining a light on why it mattered and what was at stake for Christina. Dr. Shelton for that, you know, coming in, not really being in, but supporting the efforts to make sure we can get it over the finish line. We did have a few challenges and I will try to be, you know, brief. Um, we had a few challenges leading up to the vote. One second, my just turned off. Um, one would be, of course, the coronavirus situation we had and with schools closing and that being the main way we would be able to get word out about voting, you know, attending school evening events and things such as that. So, of course, we had to pivot a few times to rethink what we could do. And we had to rely heavily on our, our digital media, social media. Um, we created a huge database with the help of our steering committee of like PTA, senior citizens, churches, fraternal organizations, unions, you name it. Any avenue we could think of to use as a, cha as a channel to get out information, um, our partners came to the table and said, hey, let's do this group. We also had the support of, you know, people who would send out messages for us in masses, like the United Way, who sent messages out for us several times to like, several times to like 80,000 people, um, um, three YMCAs. We as um, the League of Women Voters and the Newark Partnership, and of course, uh, focus to send information to your own um, personal databases. So it was very helpful. Uh, another challenge we had was about three weeks before the election, three or four, maybe four weeks before uh, Department of Elections uh, reduced the number of polling places from 28 to 11, as you guys know. So that was a um, bit of a challenge. So what we did was, of course, kept notifying like, hey, here are the changes, here are the changes. And we also had posters at each polling, polling places, like all the 28 sites that would have been a polling place. We had huge posters made up. So if someone went there, they would know where to go. That helped as well because we did get some feedback that it was good that it was there because some people did go to their normal polling place. Um, of course, then, you know, we had some Discussions around, you know, what was with the, you know, community to think that state um, and the concerns for our. Um, what I vote, yes, and we made it available for however people wanted it, they were comfortable using vote or I thought what was really helpful, again, the compelling videos from our students and our teachers, but we slightly changed the messaging to four. So you started seeing information about four because we knew that's what people would actually see on the ballot, those words four. So um, you saw some things that said like four questions, one answer in capital letters for our students, for our staff, to kind of put in the minds of the people of our voters when they got there so they'd be looking for the word for you know, to help with um, getting the referendum. Good try. <laughs> if you um, could mute yourselves if you're not speaking, just so we don't pick up all your background noise. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. So um, not to, you know, go, you know, down a long story about just like Mary said, there were several things going on beside, behind, the, behind the scenes that we did. And it would take me all day to tell you, but just so you know, you know, where, wherever there was a challenge, we made the adjustment. You know, we got together and say, hey, let's do this instead of that. And, you know, it's, it's, it's really great that the community, you know, we had a, a blueprint, if you will, for our building leaders to follow. They knew exactly what messaging needed to go out on what day and what time and what we were sending from the district office. So they said it made it easier for them. 
and you know the community got behind me and that's what we needed to get it passed you know and of course we heard that it's the largest uh, voter turnout in the history of Christina School District and during this most unprecedented time. So that's exciting to hear. And we did it. Yay, we did it. You know, everybody has to give themselves a pat on the back. We all did it. Wow. order on the CSD website, this is, we have, first was the reference, we can stay for this for a good while because the margin of wind was, uh, I'm only 10 years in the, there's ever been a referendum, certainly in Christina, maybe statewide, I don't know, um, with such resounding support, so that's super huge. But our next exciting thing to celebrate is we have, um, a new superintendent who's going to start one week from today and he introduce himself for those of you who don't know a lot about it about his team uh, uh christina community so with that i'm going to hand it over to dan good Back evening everyone can you hear me okay yes yes excellent so uh, i apologize Uh, I am uh, probably not as I appreciate uh, appreciate you inviting me tonight and I look forward to uh, being a part of this group on a regular basis um, for those of you that don't know me obviously my name is Dan Shelton I spent my entire career prior to the last five years in Christina I worked in uh, quite a few of the schools um, and was an administrator in quite a few of the schools. Um, I started my teaching career at True Pile. I actually uh, brought some boxes in the other day and uh, my office is my old reading room. Um, I then had to sign paperwork in the, uh, in the uh, benefits office, which is right next door to my old computer lab um, and got to, uh, Got to walk around my old stomping ground. So I spent my entire teaching part of my career at Drew Pyle. Uh, Drew Pyle was a was a four, five, six school at the time, and I was the computer teacher. And then from there, I went to Bayard, and then to Jones, and then to Gallagher. Uh, then I became the principal of uh, those were all administrator jobs, and then uh, assistant principal jobs. And then I went to McClary as the principal, Smith as the principal. Um, I opened the Early Childhood Center when um, Lisa Lawson became the director of special ed at the last minute, right before the center was supposed to open. I actually did that. Uh, I was at Jenny Smith still when I was the principal of the Early Childhood Center and then finished up at Kirk Middle School as the principal there before I became the superintendent in Capitol. So um, it, was, it was the headline and I love it. You know, I'm coming home. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, I have a long history in Capitol, or I'm sorry, I have a long history in Christina. Uh, my mother was the curriculum director in Christina. So um, the history goes well before my time even uh, in Christina. My mom and dad both graduated from Newark High School, as did my grandfather. So um, very much looking forward to, uh, to being a, back to being a part of Christina. And um, Looking forward to getting to work with all of you. Uh, Friends of Christina was just at its infancy um, when I left Christina, um, but it's, uh, it has an opportunity for have a great dialogue with people that really care about the district is critically important. And I think uh, becoming a 4013C is fantastic. Uh, one of the things that we had back in the day, I'm a history buff, but um, back in the day, we used to have a, a group called the Christina education fund and it was a group of uh they they called themselves do-gooders um at their banquet they had every year and they were big into scholarships for students and i talked to mary a little bit about that being a potential for you guys as well to uh to start maybe reactivating that because it was such a great opportunity to bring uh bring opportunities for our students to be able to participate in summer programs so um 
I, I also just want to reiterate, I wanted, I wanted to open with it, but uh, my audio was a little messed up. I actually got kicked out right before I got kicked back in. I was a little, uh, a little off because I wasn't sure I was going to get back in. But I wanted to open with just a huge thank you um, to Alva in particular for the passing of the referendum. I think that Rick Gregg and his team did an amazing job, but Alva certainly had a huge hand in that. So thank you, Alva. We truly appreciate you and all you did. Um, Christina took advantage of social media, which I think we all think, now uh, realize is the way that we're going to, um, to really get the word out of the great things that are going on. And Alva's done a great job of doing the, uh, getting the word out of the great work. And, and thank you to uh, um, Maybe Rick just take something a little stronger Others later. who are, um, Can you who are, yourself? Hey, I think Amy, maybe? It's Amy. Yeah. It's all good, Amy. How you doing, Amy? <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's okay. So I walked past Amy's old classroom too. Amy and I used to both teach at Drew just down the hall from each other. So looking forward to working with you, Amy. Um, so as we, uh, as we go forward, um, I I'm really excited about the transition. Uh, the team that's leaving, we have a fantastic team at Christina that's leaving, um, but they've set us up for success. Uh, Mary said I should talk a little bit about the new team coming in. We have a whole bunch of people coming home. Um, last night, we, uh, the board approved uh, three new members of the administrative team, uh, that new director of pers uh, personnel pupil support is Jeff Conkey, who was the principal of the uh, school uh, Delaware Autistic Program um, and is coming back. Uh, Chuck Longfellow was uh, made the chief financial officer, Chuck Longfellow. Uh, his first directorship was in Christina. He used to be the director of technology. Uh, we used to work together since I was a computer teacher. He was the tech coordinator, but most recently was the business manager in Appaquinimic. And after that, he was the business manager in um, for the state. He was the, the, the CFO for the state in charge of finance for the state. Uh, so he brings a lot of experience with him. And then for human resources, uh, Paul Walmsley will be joining us. Paul um, was previously the HR director in uh, Milford School District, but he has always uh, lived in Newcastle County and is looking forward to joining our team. So um, that's my update. Um, looking forward to starting July 1, um, planning on hitting the ground running, um, and uh, looking forward to working with you guys and uh, getting to participate in these meetings in the future. So thank you for inviting me, and again, looking forward to, uh, to talking at future meetings once I am the superintendent. Very good. All right. Thank you, Dan. Um, we Is he gone? Uh, he's still there, but I, I think... Dan? Are you there? Who's, who, who's, who's, uh, do you have a, you have a question? Uh, well, I wanted to say hi. He, um, I know him very well. Okay. All right. Well, maybe send him a message. Send him a message in the chat. <laughs> So you have to come and Yes. Looking awesome. forward to it. Yep. Um, Thank you. We will carry on these discussions at our, our future meetings. Um, and if you have issues or things that you specifically would like to just for friends of Christina to take up with the superintendent, um, you we can figure out what's the best way to kind of put those things forward so we can structure our agenda to have discussions about those topics. Um, so the next thing we wanted to talk about was uh, what the state is thinking that the fall is going to look like, or at least where the thinking is right now. So we have um, Mike Williams from Delaware PTA is on one of the three committees, and Darren Tyson, who's head of CEA, he um, has some insight um, on, on some of the other committees. And Kim, I think you, if, I mean, there are others who have um, either direct or secondary information, but um, getting that update for this group would be helpful. So we're going to start with you, Mike. All right, here we go. Um, so I'm Mike Williams, uh, as uh, Mary mentioned, I'm uh, with the state PTA. I was asked to 
uh, represent the PTA and also as, as a parent um, in one of the working groups. Um, I don't want to get into the details of all of this. Uh, most of you probably know about the working groups, so I don't want to get into bore you with details. Um, there are three working groups, though. Um, there's a health and wellness, there's the academics and equity, and the one that I'm working on, which is uh, operations and services. Uh, three different working groups. Um, we've um, been meeting since the beginning of June. Uh, it's once a week for an hour and a half, I think it is some, something like that. Um, each of the groups does that. Uh, basically, each of the groups is set up to develop uh, recommendations that we go to the Secretary of Education, um, to our superintendents, and also to the, the charter leaders um, of what we think, think, think that the schools should do, the state should do, in order to reopen the schools successfully. Um, there's really three areas or three scenarios that we've kind of focused on, um, all, all related, unfortunately, to this COVID virus going on. Uh, one is with minimal community spread, uh, a minimal to moderate spread, and then a significant spread. And then um, for each of those, we're look, for our group anyway, uh, we look at each of those scenarios and how they would fit into uh, what we focus on, which is facilities, operations, transportation, and technology. Um, and so for each of those, we're looking at, you know, what we should do now as we prepare for this upcoming school year, uh, what we should be doing before school opens, and then once school is open, how things should be maintained. Um, we are submitting recommendations. We're not saying you have to do all this. It's up to this, really the state, to the uh, the superintendents, the schools to make those decisions. Uh, we're just providing those recommendations. So um, under facilities, we're looking at things like supply chains, um, guidance on cleaning, uh, how uh, the school entry, the, the students, the faculties coming back to school, and the classrooms and the size of those classrooms uh, with the social distancing aspect. For um, operations, we're looking at, at really the budget, we're looking at food, uh, we're looking at enrollment and we're looking at staffing, uh, making sure all of those are in place. Transportation, and it's probably has been one of the bigger conversations, um, is one just what's the bus inventory? Um, you know, we're, we're, I think we're, we're challenged with school buses. Um, I think we're even more challenged with the school bus drivers. So uh, we're looking into all of that, um, how the school bus itself is going to look with the students on there, because right now it, it's capacity of uh, 52, I think it is. And I think the number now is at 24 for social, with social distancing involved. Um, and then just the clean guidance behind the school, the school buses uh, before the students are picked up, after the school, or I'm sorry, after the students are dropped off in between, making sure that everything is clean and ready. And then the te technology aspect of it is if we have to continue, you know, I don't want to say working from home, but school from home, um, you know, will the students be provided with Chromebooks or being utilized? Um, do the parents have um, uh, internet service at home that they can utilize at, uh, the internet? Um, and really just managing the inventory uh, for all of the Chromebooks or whatever it is that's going to be distributed out, um, to, just to make sure we have, a, have all of that uh, under control. So we are um, meeting tomorrow night and then we have uh, one more meeting next week uh, and it'll get all wrapped up from there and it gets presented uh, to the Secretary of Education from there um, with our recommendations. Okay, um, Darren, do you, you wanna add um, any um, insight? Um, only thing I really have to add is um, I, I got an email from Deidre Aiken, but we've been talking for the past week and a half, two weeks um, about um, these committees and um, we uh, put out an email to um, some members that were interested and then we turned around and had to send it out again. So we did fill up um, all the committees, the, the three um, academics and equity, health and wellness and operations and services. So there's three members from CEA on each one of those committees. Um, and I believe they have already met once and should be um, meeting moving forward. So next time I should have more information for you concerning these meetings. Okay. Um, I don't know if anyone else has anything to add. I, I keep hearing from both parents and teachers and some administrators, like there's a lot of parents who are not intending to send their kids back to school. There are 
teachers who, if school is open, they are not going to take a position because of their own health condition or um, someone in their immediate family. Um, so it it is, and then just everything you hear about, Kim, you could speak to like a, a, a class of kindergartners. I mean, can you really expect them to stay six feet apart for an entire day or even a half a day? I don't know. I mean, just the practicalities of school reopening seem enormous, but they're no less than the practicalities of digital um, learning. So I, it's, it's going to be a really tough decision to figure out what's the right, right way forward. Um, Can I throw something in? This is Helga. Yeah, um, Helga. Two thoughts. One is that there are certainly people who are afraid to send their kids to school or concerned about sending their kids to school. There are also people who will have to go back to work soon and will have to find, figure out what to do with their kids if they're not going to be able to go to school. So I think there are considerations um, from parents on both sides of that equation. Yes. And then the other thought was that there have actually been some institutions who have some experience dealing, especially with young children, um, because there, there have been childcare centers that have been caring for the children of the, of the frontline workers. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering whether we can draw some lessons from them and how they have been able to keep coronavirus um, from spreading in their, their centers. I don't actually know in Delaware, aside from the YMCA, who else falls into that category. Um, but the Y certainly could, could provide us some insight into how to do this successfully. And daycare centers are open now, all of them in Delaware. So, and there are lots and lots of children in them. I drove past three today that were outside playing. So, and I know two people that work in them. Yeah, I well, think there's a difference between daycare and school though. Most definitely, but coming as a teacher of a young child who is not going to have had a chance to make any type of a bond, trying to bond with a child across a two by two screen is a very, very difficult thing. And I don't want to turn children off from learning at age five. Yeah. Um, Fred, Polanski, is Fred Polanski ahead, Polanski with a question uh, for maybe for Mike or Darren. Uh, is there any discussion going on about children who at the end of the last school year never engaged? And what are we gonna do about contacting the children that just didn't do anything after March 13th, even though maybe they got devices but never participated? Somehow I think we gotta track them down and find out and get them back connected somehow. Oh, Fred, this is Darren Tyson. Like I said, the, um, the committee meetings, I believe they met once but um, that is a good question um, because that was a struggle. We did have a lot of students who did not participate at all. Um, I think the best thing is how do we get through to their parents that they have to do this work? Because that's where it starts at. It doesn't start, I mean, it starts at home. And these parents have to step up and be parents and tell the kids they have to work <laughs> and they have to be responsible. It's, it's the way of the way, way of the world. In all due respect, though, I have to say, Mr. Pulaski, what just occurred was a crisis Band-Aid. Yeah. If we start school off next year in either a hybrid situation or all remote, that is school. That is how it is going to be. There is no choice this time ar around with it. So I think the mindset has to be a different mindset. We went into this as crisis management and putting a Band-Aid on things. And we also don't know some of those people who didn't participate, chose not to on their own, but we also don't know what occurred in those families. Yeah. Um, and so we have to give grace through all of this and hope that next year, no matter what our situation may be, that people understand this isn't a Band-Aid anymore. This is the way things are going to go until further notice. So hopefully things will be different. Can I also say that uh, the district didn't hold the children accountable to do the work at the end of the, the year? They were given extra credit for the work that they were done, but they weren't told they had to do anything. So that's part of the issue. Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. I just think it's if we, we need to be ready for a situation where children are not all back in classroom. I think that the probability of going back the way we were a year ago was about zero. 
but the real question is, you know, when Darren mentioned it, you, you never heard from some students and it was a crisis management. And I think the teachers did a great job on it. But the question is, how do you get the word out to the parent and make sure they understand and are willing to do what they need to do to make sure their children are getting or participating remotely or however we're doing things. It's a new world. And, and I think it's a, uh, you know, the teachers can adapt to it a lot easier, I think, than some parents do. And some parents adapted to it great. And other ones probably didn't adapt to it at all. Because for them, school is, I send the kids out to school and they come back home at night, but it's the school's responsibility to educate them. And, and you go from that range all the way to parents that say, it's my responsibility. Even if the kids never physically get in class, I'm gonna make sure they get educated. So we need to deal with those parents. And how do you, my question, and I don't have an answer, I just think it's a concern for the children. How do you do it for children that live in situations where the parents aren't engaged in doing that? I don't know the answer, I'm just raising the question, so. Yeah. May I make a suggestion? Oh, I yeah. Can I make a suggestion? He said that <laughs> okay. Um, the, the suggestion that I would have is if parents are going to hold their children not to come to school, then they need to sign some kind of a waiver saying they're not going to do it, that their child will be remotely. Um, if, if we choose to go back to school and they don't want to, that's what I mean. Then if they, they're going to be remotely attending classes, great, wonderful, that's fine. Then you need to be held accountable. And if you're not doing your work, it's 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 you know um you're, you're going to be held uh you're going to get uh in trouble you know those are absences that will stock up you know and then you know mr get is going to come and get you so okay. and that's the way it should be that's all. i would like to jump in here so my kids did great with the remote learning um but i know from some of my kids friends parents that for some of them, it was a real struggle. And it's not that the parents weren't engaged, that they didn't try, but you know, if you have three kids who are in elementary school and they're all supposed to be on Zoom at the same time for different classes, it's sometimes it feels overwhelming from the, for the parents as well. And I think we shouldn't leave, lose sight of the fact that parents were struggling a lot with trying to make this work and struggling with their own responsibilities of having to work and manage their children at the same time at home. Yeah. Yeah. So even if it is remote learning, it, it is, there are lots of things that are going to have to be considered because as Helga pointed out in the very beginning, like, you know, parents are going to increasingly be going back to work as workplaces are opening up doesn't just because and so I agree with yeah. you all and I think that that would be something that a parent would need to have under consideration when they make the decision whether or not they're going to send the child back that was right. my point right. if you right. cannot do it and you cannot hold your child accountable then you can't do it and you're going to need to send that child back if that's a possibility right that's I, all. I just like just like you have to send your kids in with supplies. You just got to do it. <laughs> yep. Okay. I'm muting myself now. Mary, okay. can I say something? Yeah. I feel like, too, a lot of people, it's not a choice. And I think we need to be sensitive as everybody puts their two cents into these different group work groups. Some parents don't choose to go to work or whatever. And it, parents who are working at home while their children are trying to go to school at home. I'm a teacher. I have kids. Both the parents I work with have children at home. So there could be teachers teaching their own children too. Am I signing a waiver saying my kid doesn't get to learn? You know what I mean? Like, I think that that's a consideration that we need to keep in, our, in the forefront of our minds, that everybody has different circumstances. I think it, hi, this is Kim Allen. I think it's really important too that we also, you know, reach out to the parents and don't make this a punitive effort. Mm -hmm. That some of these parents only help them. Lot. Some have been homeless, some have been going through their own family struggles and health issues. And it's how we reach out to the parents and connect with them that will get them engaged with us. You know, we, I did that this year with, with my students. So I, I just share that with you. And I certainly would be available for a future discussion. Hello, this is Leandra Casson. Can you Hi. hear me? Yes. Hi. Um, I'm new to this um, group. Um, Dan Shelton actually asked me to um, actually be on this particular call. Um, I'm from Capital School District, basically. Oh. 
And I worked with him from, I was the chairman of Friends for Capital School District. And now that you guys, um, you know, have him there, I also want to continue to um, work with him. One of the things that we do, um, and I don't work at Capital School District, I was just part of this particular, um, you know, group, just as you have the one for Christina. But the comment I wanted to make was, number one, um, I'm vice president for external relations and development for a company called Demco. And what we did was we had to support a lot of our, of the families in Kent County, in particular Caesar Rodney and Capital School District, because some of the parents did struggle. They did not, some of them didn't have the educational uh, ability to help their children. That was one of the issues. And so what we do, um, the name of my company again is Demco, and one of the things we do is we run a lot of various um, creative programming in a lot of schools in Kent County. And so because the parents knew us, because we're in a lot of the 20th century um, schools, et cetera, they actually talked to us. And, and you know, we were able to really support them in areas um, of just helping them with their kids, particularly the math um, that some of the students had to do, um, particularly if they were in the high school, they were really struggling. So I'm, what I'm saying is maybe we can um, engage if you have more outside partners that could um, help support the teachers in their effort to actually try to teach, you know, um the kids and the parents to make the parents feel more comfortable some parents felt uncomfortable explaining to the teachers that they felt inept when it came to teaching their kids and yeah. so they just didn't want to be involved they would try to leave or they would call us and say she keeps calling me and i don't know what to say to her and so those are the things i just want you to consider we have to support the uh parents in this crisis as well because they really do not know what to do Okay. I wanted to put that out there. Th thank you, Leandra. That was really helpful. And um, just before you started to, to speak, I was thinking through all the comments and thinking that maybe one of the things that we should uh, be centered on next year with the learning in whatever format it takes is, is a new approach to parent engagement and really trying to figure out how 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 can we help get to every parent and try to understand you know what their their needs are and how we can best support them so hopefully we can talk some more because it sounds like you have a lot of good insight thank you thank you this is fred thank you very much because uh I, I will almost summarize it that what we're going to need to do not only as a district but i think statewide is we may need to educate some parents on how to educate their children because they need to be much more involved than they were before and uh, it's just the world is different so i think we need to, to look at take a look at that you know we i know we support uh, the organization of um it's called parents as teachers that focuses on children uh that are preschool we may need to look from something similar for parents as teachers for parents of children that are in school and, uh, and to help them understand and learn the technology and what's going on because school is so much different today than it was 20 years ago. You can have people who maybe did all right in school 20 years ago and today they may not be able to help their children because it's just nothing that, you know, they just don't have the educational background to do that. Not faulting them, but that's the reality of where some people are. We need to deal with that. So. Yeah. I want to make one more, one more comment. I'm sorry. We passed out Chromebooks to many of these parents as well. And when we did that, there were some parents that said, I'm just simply embarrassed. I can't help my kid. And I just wanted to make sure I mentioned that because being embarrassed like that in front of your kid and the the teacher is a terrible spot to be in and these are so-called some of these parents that i'm talking about actually have good jobs they just don't know calculus they just don't know trig <laughs> they just don't know plain geometry okay i just want to you know be clear that you understand that these are not just parents that you know um are not educated parents they're just yeah. not good in those areas yeah yeah, and yeah. so they feel humiliated thank you so some creative thinking we really have to come up with some mm -hmm. this is all new on charter territory where we're going to be going into regardless of what it looks like so um creative out of the box thinking is 
what we need to come up with and how to engage and how to support, right? Mary? Yeah. Mary? Um, so I read this morning about Fairfax County in Virginia, and one of the things that they have said is that parents and teachers both get to choose. They need to decide if they want to do hybrid or all online um, by mid-July so that they can plan. Mm -hmm. And the idea being that some teachers maybe will be all, want to do all online, and so they'll teach parents or the children who are, want to stay all online and that type of thing. So I thought that that was an interesting way of doing it. And then they were doing planning for two-day schools. So kids would go two days a week and then another kids go two days a week with the fifth day being to communicate with parents to give teachers more planning time or whatever else might be needed development wise so I I was impressed with kind of that idea I mean I don't know how it will go that certainly could help with some of the busing issues potentially as well um, and I am looking forward to having more conversations about creatively reaching out to parents to see how how can we help them i know when my kids were in school the elementary school especially we did um math and reading and those type of nights so that parents could come and see what the curriculum is see what their kids are learning so that they would have an idea like if you're going to help your child this is how you would do it and i know a number of times we were told if your child is struggling just have them let us know because then we will need to figure out how to help them so the idea isn't that parents have to teach their children or have to help their kids with their homework so it sounds like a lot of that can be brought in some sort of communication whether it's some teachers who need to stay home um, and maybe they can reach out to parents in small zoom classes um, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity for engagement a lot of opportunity for creative ways of doing things and we really need to think out of the box yeah. um monica, to be honest i have a hundred ideas monica i love what you just said that's perfect uh i also i just kind of said this in chat but i really feel as though um it upsets me to hear parents are teaching their children and parents are struggling with learn teaching their children tech calculus and all that stuff we have teachers who are educated why are the parents feeling like they need to do it? What I would do if I were that child's parent, I would be saying, hey, you know what? Message your teacher and find out, let her know that you did, or him, know you did this, this, and this, and you don't get it. They need to teach it to you in a different way. Why, that, that's something that makes me absolutely crazy when parents are like, I don't understand this and I can't teach it. Well, why are you? I, got, I have a degree, I have two degrees. I know how to do it. You just need to let me know what your issues are. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, <laughs> parents also like to be able to help their kids with homework or if, they're yes. if there's not a process to, you do not have to, if you try and get it wrong, you still get credit. Like yeah. the best classes my kids were in is you either got a point or you didn't because you either right. tried or you didn't, right? Yeah. But that's not how the classes are set up and that might be something that needs to come from an administrative level that we I need to agree. we look at this. So there's I lots of opportunities. I think to, yeah, I feel like we have an opportunity to really look for a more 21st century learning model um, long term. But this may force some changes that should be happening anyways. Um, so I decided to see the positive side of this as opposed to all the struggles that are coming. <laughs> but thank you. Mary, one of the things you had said earlier at the beginning of the meeting was looking at a focus you know, for Friends of Christina and kind of once we know, which mid-July, they say the governor, and I could be wrong, Mike and Darren, but from what I understand, mid-July, he's supposed to come out with his guidelines as to what then the districts then have to kind of follow to decide what they're doing. Um, and it is under my understanding that there's three options, all in school, hybrid, or all remote um to do for instruction but maybe this organization this group needs to start to change their focus temporarily you know but parents speaking you know back to what leandra was saying sometimes parents are more willing to go to other parents 
yeah. or other community members and not necessarily go to the teacher because they don't want the teacher to know um, where they're struggling or whatever. But if this, you know, group can kind of lend out to do. And I know the other thing is, is that, and it was being brought up in the um, chat, um, that grading. Well, if we go back to school and it's all remote, there's going to be grading because that's the way school's going to be. It was a Band-Aid and it was a reaction to a crisis this time around. So we couldn't hold anybody responsible because it was all thrown together. And But it definitely will be um, grades this time. You'll be accountable. All of it will be. But I'm wondering if parents would be more willing to open up to other parents or just community members who were willing to help them rather than go to the teachers sometimes. Yeah, maybe we can be part of helping facilitate some 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 parent networks in a, a different way than what the PTA, you know, the PTA is kind of like a fundraising network and we could be more of an instructional network maybe or something like that. Right, and if it's not directly connected to the schools per se, it's not, right. I'm asking the teacher or asking the para that maybe some of the parents would be more willing and more open to saying, I, how can you help me? What, what, what? what suggestions do you have or what could you do or what can I do with right. your help? Yeah. Um, because sometimes going to the school is scary. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds okay. Like some of you are not familiar with, with Demco, but Demco, we actually are a, a company that offers um, tutorial services already. And we've done it for about 20 years in, in our community. So parents, yeah, when they have problems or issues, Leo, they come to us. Leo, Leo, Leo. Play. So I don't know what that is, but they come to us. Um, and then we offer, we have tutors for them that they need tutors. Um, and we've offered that all the time. And so that's one of the reasons why they feel comfortable. I wanted to be very clear with that because we specialize in, the, in maths and science and, you know, and we keep current with the, um, the subjects that they have. So it just makes them feel comfortable. I just want to put that out there. Okay. Oh, that's good. I'm in Glasgow, and I'm just wondering if we want to make another resource as maybe some retired teachers. Because I know as good a idea. retired teacher, I would love to be able to have some students who were struggling or a teacher who knew that they were having students that struggled, maybe somehow contact. I don't know if you can have a way to contact where it takes a little, little bit off the teacher because they do have 25 if they're you know dealing with their classroom to maybe reach out to some retired teachers who have taught that grade and are still familiar with the curriculum to be able to help them and maybe even if it's other students like brothers and sisters of other students of parents who might know you who feel a little bit more comfortable coming to you and ask for help because they do need help that that's one of the most difficult things that the teachers were struggling with is how do you help the students who either aren't doing the work or aren't doing it well so just a thought that's a great thought lynn um, I'll add in here that one of the things that i found really helpful is being connected to the other parents of the kids in the same class and i think that's something that i've always felt was a little lacking at the school even before the crisis that you know we we never get a list of all the students and contact information for all the other parents in the class um and i was just really happy that i had already connected to the other parents before the epidemic um and could could continue um being in touch with them so i think maybe encouraging I don't think we necessarily need to reach out to retired teachers and companies that can provide tutorials. I think just a homegrown network of, of parents and also of friends, right? The, the kids help each other when they're in the classroom together. And if we can figure out how to get them to, to be in touch, even when they can't be in the classroom together so that they can help each other, I think that would be useful. So lots of different models we can look at, and I think maybe they all might be attractive to different people. So there's there's no one size is perfect for everyone. So um, connecting parent uh, connecting parents, I think a huge challenge is going to be to start a year online and not have that physical connection. That that it's not impossible, but um, I. I, I can't quite see a completely remote learning. I, I, I sort of think a hybrid has to be, has to be in there because the touch, not that 
physical touch, but the, you know, the human face to face is, is an important part of the connection. So um, if that's anything you guys can take back to the committees, I know I've heard some people say either all in or all out, like I'm not sure how the hybrid would work. I'm guessing from a instructional standpoint and a grading, if we are doing a hybrid model, the pace is going to have to, you know, you're not going to be able to maintain the same pace of instruction and learning. I'm guessing that's, that's a lot to try to do, but these are all things that will have to be um, looked at. So um, just uh, keeping an eye on the time, we're at about 725 and our last item was next step. So we kind of like did a nice little segue from uh, the committees into next steps. And I think all of these comments about ways that we can support our students and our families and our teachers and our schools is great. Um, Navid, were there any other comments that came in on the questionnaire that we did that um, might be helpful to bring up? Uh, give me just one second. Let me pull that document up and see if there were any new responses. Okay. Um, it'll just be a moment. So, Leandric, can I ask you a question? As the Friends of Capital, what other sorts of things did you, did your group do to support Capital School District? You're muted. Yep. Oh, Navita is sharing the screen. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, we're actually new. So we did, we worked with Demco. Demco is actually um, 20 years in, in the, um, you know, in the running. So basically we use the resources from Demco and we just worked with Demco. Uh, okay. One of the things that we did um, is that we were able to get some grant money to do, to work with um, particularly um, single women and what we did, women who had children. And what we did is that we worked on that, we worked with them to help their technology skills, that some of them were just not good with, with operating a computer. You mm -hmm. may think that is crazy in this day and age, but um, it actually is an issue. And so some of the parents, we found out that some of them had kids, but they not only couldn't help them with the work, but they didn't have basic computer skills. So what we did was provide computer skills, you know, computer skills help. We hired um, a teacher to do um, YouTube videos as well as actually teach them to help them with their skills. So that was one of the things just to make them comfortable. Another thing we did was to help um, tutor and work with their kids. If they, if they said, you know, they were having difficulty with if they had two or three kids, which most of them, the average is that they had two or three, then we would assign someone to work with whatever age group they were having difficulty with. Um, and then we also contrib and we also contributed flex cards, which uh, which is just money for, you know, things that they needed. Okay. You know? So we provided that for um, about seventy students. I mean, seventy parents from um you know a number of the schools particularly we worked a lot with town point kids their parents okay so those are some of the things we did okay all right so you guys kind of emerged in the midst of this uh in the midst of the pandemic or just before the pandemic yes because see we're new okay um, all we, right. we actually came out of the referendum because i helped um I helped Dr. Shelton with the Capital School District referendum. Gotcha. And from that, um, he wanted to develop a, a Friends of Capital School District. But we were new, so we partnered with Demco, which I'm also you know, a part of, right. Right. so that we could have the resources to be effective gotcha. um, because we've already been in the community a long time. Yeah. So that's what we did. OK, all right. Good, that's helpful. All right, Navid. Um, I know you put it up there, but um, oh, and you're so good at being able to crunch crunch data very quickly. So what can you tell us? Okay, so uh, this is the most uh, interesting part. Um, you know, the comments, uh, the three challenges, teacher retention, 
SRO role in training, trauma-informed, part of school, school community, diversity, uh, reputation. This word appears a few times, lack of parent engagement, um, lack of engaging curriculum disappears mm -hmm. at least uh, twice. There was another one, you know, uh, about curricula. Uh, lack of respect for teacher, teachers, either their time or their knowledge. Class size, public perception, and perception is also repeated a few times. Mm -hmm. uh, retention of our students, effective communication between district and the school staff. Uh, creating district-wide pride, engaging families. So you can see that many of these have appeared more than once. Uh, in terms of opportunities, um, of course, uh, momentum from the successful referendum, um, increase of professional development for teachers, uh, reach community partners, communicate positives, um, PDs should be more differentiated. So again, professional development, uh, emotional training, programs for staff, family, and students. So, okay. Uh, so um, Dan, since Dan is here, maybe Dan can also make a comment on these. Uh, you know, this is just, yeah, I, I, these are raw feelings. You know, we sent out this email probably three, three, four hours ago, and yeah. you know, this is what we have received. So yeah, yeah. So he, I think he must be looking at a house right now. Um, so okay. he, he's not with us anymore. Oh, okay. um, but we can certainly uh, share I, this. Um, uh, and I, I think can, some I can, of these. I can hear yeah. him. Sorry, who wants to say something? No. Is that Dan? I'm still here. I'm oh, you are still there. I saw you go. So, oh. um, I didn't uh, see you on the call I anymore. Did. So, kicked um, out two or three. I've been kicked out. So I'm here. All right. Did you did you hear what we just went through? Are you seeing? Can you see this? Are you seeing the screen? I can't see anything. Uh, it's too small on my little screen. Okay. But um, I was I was sort of listening. Uh, I was the, I didn't understand at first what we were looking what we were talking about. But then at, he he circled back at the end and he repeated it again. So I I figured out what it was. Okay. So yeah. So when we put our message out on the Facebook page today about um, the meeting, reminder about the meeting, um, because uh, I, some parents and teachers have been having lots of little sidebar discussions about uh, things that they think need to fix and uh, figure or just how Christina fits into the larger picture of Delaware education. I know uh, changing the funding systems, that hasn't come up here because that's not specific to Christina, but there's a lot of energy and momentum. So our intent was to try to see what the feeling was on how we could take the energy that we had pulled together and cultivated during the referendum campaign and put it to some really good use. So some of these things I think are district focused and some of them are things that we can help with, but um, go ahead and comment. So I guess, um, you know, not the superintendent yet and need to obviously have conversations with, uh, with the board, but it would be my, intention to um, activate this energy by getting a normal process. It's nice to collect information on the internet. It's nice to have conversations. Oh, he just got but Really, if, if that's all you do, then you're not going to get anywhere. So yeah. I would hope to form a process that doesn't just uh, doesn't just talk to formulate moving forward. I teach a plan side group to help facilitate it to make sure that it wasn't just a bunch of people talking, but truly came to a plan of action in the end. Um, and it would be my hope that that's what we do. I think yeah. I agree. We have to capitalize on the energy. We have to capitalize on the number of people that want to be uh, and participate in the 
process. But um, if all we do is talk about it, then it's really a waste of breath. <laughs> <We> <laughs> The connection is not good. That we can capture in a way that it can turn from ideas into action and that we can figure out what are the, we can't do it all at once. So we right. have to prioritize and figure out which from and actually do. Right. Yes. So I, I, I think what um, Dan was saying is, is that uh, he intends to get a formalized process of planning going where, where, where uh, this kind of feedback will be collected and prioritized. So, um, yeah, he's still there. I, I think that's it. The, um, any, I'm trying to, so um, one thing that, uh, so I, th I think based on all the discussions we've had tonight, what our short-term focus can be is working. Dan, you're back. I, I see you and unmuted. I don't know if you wanted to say anything else. No. I think I'm coming in and out. Did I, I, it was a great speech. Did, did you guys hear? No. Dan, this is, um, can you try, try dialing in again? Uh, your voice is breaking up um, in a very funny manner. <laughs> Um, so a couple of things that popped out at me, to, to me, in going through the list is the idea of district-wide pride. I think that is something that um, we have a lot of schools that have amazing pride, but it's not necessarily linked together. Um, so that's something I can see us trying to help the schools in the district with, um, in addition to the engagement. Um, teacher retention and PD, that's kind of a district level thing, but also being a liaison for bringing in community partners. Um, Alva made a great start with a lot of community partners for the referendum, um, and we can certainly help um, do that. Like the, the Newark partnership is a great one, but there are others. So I think those are the two areas that I would see Friends of Christina could specifically help. So, um, this is, this is an idea. Uh, Fred, just to, uh, a little bit on one of your ideas was people's perception of the district. And I've heard this from every administrator I've worked with in this district over almost 10 years. Parents said, my school's great. It's the other ones in the district that aren't any good. So we need to, to get a Christina School District unity so parents understand what all the other schools are like and yeah. how there's good things going on in all the schools. So it's not mine against yours. It's all of our schools and it's our district working together, so. Yeah. And, and can I make one comment? I just wanna say, um, that is why I think it's good that Dr. Shelton is coming there because that's one of the things that he can bring to the table. He's good with working with community partners and with, you know, with, you know, all kinds of leaders and his own staff to build confidence mm -hmm. in the area where you may think there's, you know, something lacking. He's able to really build that confidence, which then brings pride. Because, you know, I live right now in Capital School District, but when I found out that he was leaving, I was like, and my kids are in Capital, and I'm thinking about moving to Newark, I said, oh, now Christina is not going to be that bad because he's there. Now, that's a reaction from a parent. I have two kids. So, they're sharing a real feeling with, with you guys. That's true. All right. Well, there's a home for you here. You know that, right? <laughs> Thank you so much. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. Um, Mary, I, one thing, could, yeah. all the comments you got, could you share them with Dan and Alva so that uh, they're available to people in the district, not just in Friends of Christina? Absolutely. Absolutely. 
because there's a lot of things that I've heard before, but I think there's some other things that maybe are new, whatever, that we need to, to understand. And, and Dan needs those to work with. Yeah, I mean, it's a starting point. Obviously, this isn't this yes. isn't the the final um, the final piece of trying to understand um, what the next steps are. And I know Dan's coming with a lot of his own ideas, but um, yeah, we will absolutely share these um, with district as well as the rest of the friends of Christina. We generally write up some notes of our meeting and we can share these out and put it on the, on the Facebook page. So any other, so I mentioned at the very beginning that our next meeting is going to be the third Thursday, which for July is the 16th, which if the governor actually does decide and announce on the 15th, what the new plans are, maybe that'll be a good timing. Um, um, but that, that'll be the date of our next meeting, 6.30, same, same Zoom room. Because I don't think we're gonna be, I, I, unfortunately we can't meet. I would love for us to all to be able to meet, but um, it may be a little while before we do that. Um, so any uh, anyone else have a final word, comment? I wanna thank everybody for, for joining us tonight and um, their, comment and their feedback. Again, the support for the referendum and the overwhelming show of support for the district. It really is an exciting time right now. I'm, I do have a question. Yeah, Rebecca. Hi, yes, this is Rebecca Kornbach speaking. I was wondering if there's anything that we could be doing now in terms of um, changing the funding model. I know, like you said, that's not just for our district, but there are is, um, you know, that we had such momentum with the referendum, and I think there are a lot of people who feel really passionately that we don't ever want to do this again. Yes. Um, so is there something between now and the next meeting, which happens to be my birthday, so. Oh, <laughs> birthday. Um, is here's what I'm, I'm thinking. This is what, I, that change is gonna require legislator engagement. Um, Right now, we don't have anybody's attention because they're wrapping up the year and they're not doing anything that uh, is the least bit uh, complicated. Um, uh, but Mary, Mary, uh, yeah. Rebecca brings a very good point. Uh, I think we should, uh, you know, what we discussed earlier today, uh, meeting with the uh, legislators, uh, that we expand that not just meeting, uh, you know, creating an opportunity to, for, for them to meet with uh, Dan, but also uh, talk about these issues, you know, while, while, you know, our core group is present. Absolutely. The, the, what I think might be a good first step is our new CFO, if I'm not mistaken, has quite a bit of knowledge about how state level funding works. Um, so tapping his, Brain, as well as talking to other, you know, some of the legislators. There are legislators who are interested in working on this. They got a lot of pushback last year for a lot of different reasons. Some things remain, some things are changing. The, um, the loss, the, the um, assessments, like reassessment was a huge thing. That now looks like it's going to be on the table. We don't know exactly when, but things are slowly happening to make the ground a little bit more fertile for some push to reform the way we um, fund education, public education. So it's definitely something um, that can be an action of this group because there was an amazing amount of interest in that. And I know quite a few people who are on this call tonight, um, ex they're here because th of that interest. So. Um, we'll, we'll keep that, that, that's an issue that we'll keep talking about. I'll just throw in there real quick that I think this is a really good time for those of us who in, are associated with Christina to make this ask because after such a successful referendum, it's not going to come across as us saying, oh, please abolish the referendum system because we can never get ours passed, right? So we, we have shown that we have community support for the schools and nonetheless, this is a horrible system. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's a, we, we are in a good position to push that because it's not, it's not a sour grapes issue. <laughs> it's a, this is a ridiculous system.
Yeah. yeah and this is Fred. I think right now you won't get anything out of the General Assembly through the end of June, but just because they're not in session until next January, they're still working. So after June 30th is a good time to talk to them because they're not committed to meeting as members of the General Assembly until January so that we can get work done, you know, maybe not a lot over the summer because they sort of take their vacation in, but starting in the fall, we get a lot more opportunity to work with them. And everything I've heard is there are members of the General Assembly who are interested, but the first thing that needs to be resolved is property tax assessments and get that whole system fixed, uh, not only from a school district viewpoint, but from a, a county uh, you know, revenue viewpoint. Uh, and then if property taxes are gonna be part of the system, then that's been fixed beforehand. Until you get that fixed, I don't think you're gonna see much move, movement at all. So unless okay. they would do something totally different and take it away from property taxes and make it state revenue, but. Uh, that, that would be, that, that'd be some really out of the box thinking I hey. see that coming out of our legislature, but you never know. John. Mayor, Mayor yeah, can I just jump in? Um, Mr. Pulaski, just, just two things there real quick. Um, do you have a sense of the timing of that? If that needs to be settled first, what kind of timing are we looking at for that? And then I think my wife has presented to, to some of the, the, the folks that were on the referendum email list. Has anybody looked at other systems in other states that have removed a referendum system and sort of what was their tactics? How did they go about successfully changing that system? First question on timing. What I know is this is just what's available in the public. The lawsuit that was raised about property taxes and uh, the funding for children in, in Wilmington is not, uh, doesn't consider equity and isn't sufficient. The courts have said that the current system is unconstitutional and they're gonna to continue to work on it, but they didn't establish any time frame for when decisions were gonna be made. And uh, so I think the, the what I understand is the statement about unconstitutional is because the, the assessments have not been redone every 10 years the way Delaware Code says they should be, but there's no requirement to have it done. I do know that there has been discussion about property tax assessment systems that are used in other states and other towns, uh, parts of the country it's an ongoing routine kind of computer driven process as properties are bought and sold. So it's a regular routine update to property assessments. And in some parts of the country that builds in the small 2% cost of living increase to the property, to the tax assessment. So the districts get an increase every year as that process goes on. I know there's people interested in that, but I think everybody's waiting for the lawsuit to work its way through before they, they embark on that because people don't want to spend time and money on one direction and then find out the courts make you go a different direction. Um, as far as states that have changed from a referendum system to something else, I don't know of any states that have done that. I know most states do something different. Um, there was a study done probably about two years ago that uh, Senator Representative Earl Jakes headed up uh, was you know done by the state the General Assembly to look at consolidating schools in Newcastle County or statewide, statewide. and that looked at the, and that looked at funding methods and when they looked at other districts um, like you look in uh, the state of Maryland in Maryland school districts are on a countywide basis and I don't know all the details but as I understand. The funding in Maryland is half by the state and half by the county government because the county government runs the school districts and everything they looked at there, the, the, uh, the tax assessments were significantly higher in uh, counties, comparable counties in, in Maryland to what you'd have if you did all of Newcastle County. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, you know, there's been some suggestions uh, in fact, Earl Jakes uh, introduced legislation a year ago that would give the school boards the ability to raise taxes 2% a year for a cost of living increase. <laughs> Initially, it was whatever was larger, and then it was changed to whichever is smaller. And we looked at what would have happened in Christina if we would have applied that after the successful referendum in 2011 and found out if we went with the higher of the two, our tax rate would have been 20 cents less than it was when we failed the last referendum and we didn't have enough money to run the district. And if you went to the lower, it was 25 cents. So I wasn't real thrilled about that option either. Um, 
Some people have said, let's look at the Pennsylvania system. That's a totally different system in that the school board set the tax rate and the school districts are funded almost entirely by local district funding and totally different system. So there's lots of different ways to do it. It's just a matter of which way do you want to go do it. And the other question always is, how much money do you want to spend? And when you look at uh, people say, well, we don't spend as much as or we spend more, but there's other statistics that will tell you we spend more than other districts in other parts of the country. So it's uh, there's information all over the place, and uh, it's going to be a hard sell to, to, to work it out. And the other thing, thing I've learned talking to people over the state, you got totally different ideas in different counties in Delaware, and um, it, it's going to be a real struggle as we go through this. So we'll see. I think there's a lot of truth to that, that it is going to be a real struggle. And that's exactly why I think we shouldn't wait for this to go through the courts, but we yeah. should start having this con these conversations with the legislators now. And I don't think we need to necessarily start with having a, a solution in mind, but you know, we can start the conversation and see what is what is what the legislators are amenable to. Um, I will throw out um, some cold water there relative to the lawsuit. I came from Ohio, where the courts there decided about 20 years ago that their school funding system was unconstitutional, and they still haven't fixed it. So yeah. another reason not to wait for the courts to fix our system here. I mean, there's, there's lots of part about the funding system. One of the things a lot of people don't know, there's called equalization funding within the state of Delaware. And this was developed many, many years ago. And essentially, every district gets additional money per uh, unit and it varies all over the place. Um, we get, if I remember this off the top of my head, we get like $6,000 a unit. Appaquinimic gets about 15,000. Some of the districts downstate get comparable to that. But Indian River and Cape Henlopen only get about 1,000 or less than 2,000. So um, there's lots of issues with that too. So um, yeah, lots of things to consider on the whole thing. So, you know, and, and a lot of it's going to get into equity funding too, because there are some areas in the state that don't have the tax base to provide the adequate money that they need for students, students in poverty, different diverse uh, populations. So it's, uh, we, you're right. I agree. We, it's, the opportunity is there to start discussing with ref, with members of the general assembly. And there's some that are very interested in it and but don't be surprised if you get comments that says we're waiting for the assessment to issue to get settled first. So we'll see what happens. So, so hi guys, this is Claire O'Neill. If I could say, oh, if I could yeah, just go ahead, Claire. a little bit. Um, I actually spoke with Senator Sokola yesterday um, on the phone, and I mean, he kind of just kind of called out of the blue to congratulate us on uh, getting Dan to come to the district and on a successful referendum. And he's like, you know, let me know if there's anything I can do with you. And I instantly applied him with uh, Rebecca's question, which is, how are you going to solve um, the problem of the referendum system? And um, it was crickets. He's like, well, you know, he's wor he's been, wor he says, you know, he and his colleagues have been trying to reform the referendum system for decades and they there's not the legislative will statewide to reform it and he says this is what he said that we're he's afraid that we're just going to have to wait for the courts to decide so this is our senator who is saying that effectively he doesn't see that it's possible and we should just wait for the courts to decide so i would urge everybody to continue to keep in mind the painful journey that we just went through because unfortunately, as Helga pointed out, our success means that the system works. <laughs> so. um, well, I, I hear what you're saying, Claire. And uh, what I was gonna say before you jumped in is that what I think we should do now is to try to join forces with parents and community groups and frustrated people in other districts. The reason why there's no political will is because there's no constituent pressure to change the system or insufficient constituent pressure. Um, most of the people who lobby their legislators want to keep this ability to vote no on a tax. Um, and they're very vocal about that. So we need, and, and so anything that happens is going to need statewide buy-in. The needs are very different from county to county to county. 
Um, so what I would encourage people to do is to link up with your friends and colleagues in other districts in other counties and let's start having a statewide discussion because that's what it's going to take. And, and we can, we can try to lead it, um, and lead from in front because we just passed our referendum. Um, but, but that we, this is, this, this has, to, legislators will listen to their constituents. And if there's enough constituents who are clamoring for change, then Fred is smiling. Maybe he doesn't think there's enough people who come forward, but, um, uh, yeah, that, that is the only way things change. And uh, there was a, we're going a little bit long. There was a movie that I went to uh, that was hosted by Delaware Can some months ago about this woman and it's for charters, which is a whole different thing. But she got the District of Columbia to accept, a, I forget the exact details, but she was a mother who wanted change and no one was taking her on. And so she educated herself and she lobbied and lobbied and lobbied and lobbied and she got change. So that's what we need to do if we want change. We really need to mobilize the ground forces. This is an election year. So it's probably for a lot of reasons, a good time to, um, to push. So Mary, maybe if, if, if I could jump in. I, yeah, go ahead, John. I was gonna say, I, I, I think that, that that's fantastic. If this, were, if if our group or if there's somebody else who could take a lead, I think that somebody's is is probably going to need to do that to step up. Otherwise, what you'll probably end up having is a bunch of individual conversations. Because for all we know, there's a conversation similar to this down in Sussex or anywhere else. Right. And a bunch of little conversations won't move the needle. Well, Correct. To, to your point, you need we need to to coalesce and sort of come together as a unified force for this. Um, would that be something that this group would be willing to do or, or should, you know, folks in this meeting today who, who this really does sort of seem to be the, the top issue for them. Is there somewhere else that, that perhaps we should, you know, figure out where to, to start that initiative. I think a place to start is to invite the, the legislators who like to come to the Friends of Christina meetings to have a conversation. And I think they have a lot of insight into what the hurdles are and who among their colleagues are the big stumbling blocks. Mm -hmm. And then we can reach out to people in, in those districts who are connected to the school systems there. I think that actually the lawsuit grew out of Sussex County. So I think it's not just, and you know that's wrong? No, it's not a woman's thing. Okay, I, I thought that I'd heard that there were, were complaints from Laurel that had, had touched it off. Um, but anyway, I, at least what I'm pretty confident in is that it's not just a Newcastle County problem, that there are other school districts and other counties who feel equally um, yes. frustrated what, with the yeah what, you, yeah, what I've heard is that when Governor Carney proposes $50 million of total state money to build a new school in Wilmington, or there's discussion where we need to put more money in Wilmington, and you hear complaints, Dan Shell will tell you this too, his the capital district was very similar in demographics to Christina. And if you go down in Georgetown and Laurel, there's some pockets of high poverty levels down there also. So the issue is throughout the state. What I've heard from people downstate is how come everybody just wants to put the money in Wilmington? Why can't you give me money to build my new school? Um, so that's where a lot of the upstate downstate comes from. So, Right. But if we find ourselves on the same side of the the um struggle i think we can we can um, form a coalition there and instead of always being antagonistic downstate versus upstate i think we can we can work together one thing one thing i would recommend and i and i i think this is a good area for friends of christina to get engaged with and all i've heard over the number of years is we need a better system but i haven't heard anybody say here's a better system and go to the members of general assembly and say why don't we do it this way so I think what's going to help push that is going with a recommendation to members of the General Assembly who are willing to work it with a recommended change, not just we need to do something better. Yeah. Um, you know, so, I mean, because they'll, if there's, if you can get a coalition of people who said, let's go to a system like whatever it is, pick a, pick a state, um, then you can see what's going on. I'd like to thank everyone, you know, who joined in. 
this is one of the reasons and one of the purposes behind the existence of this organization to have an open uh, conversations. You know, all the other forums that we have, uh, it can be very uh, formal, it can be very intimidating. Uh, you know, even being able to speak can be, you know, can be a very formal process. And this is the reason we had this. So I, I appreciate everyone, you know, uh, who, who spoke passionately, uh, you know, Leandra, uh, Halga, many others, you know, thank you for your passion. I appreciate it very much. Um, and, and I'm glad that board members are able to join this, you know, because otherwise board members would not have this type of open, free, back and forth uh, dialogue, you know, uh, certainly we can't expect that in a, in a board meeting. Um, so, so I think, I think we, we need to continue on uh, uh, and, and continue to make efforts uh, to make Christina an even better uh, school district. Okay, you guys. All right. Apparently I have a job, a second job now. No, wait, a third job now. Nice. <laughs> well. <laughs> no, it'll be good. It'll be good. Yeah, it'll give you something fine. to do over the summer. Yes, All right. Thank you, everyone, for hanging in there till way till the end. We didn't expect to go nearly this long, but it was good discussion. And um, we will talk again soon. There'll be this separate meeting that'll happen sometime within the next week, and then the Friends of Christina meeting happens on the sixteenth. Okay. And we sent some notes out about this. <laughs> okay. Okay. Mary, I have an eye doctor's appointment tomorrow, but can we chat? Sure. Tomorrow. All right. Yeah. Give me a call. Okay. okay. All right. See you guys. Thanks, everyone. Nice you all that Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.